way out for the foreseeable future. Lise Doucette, is there any hope of that political solution? Charles Lister is a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. Nothing at the moment, to be frank. I mean, the political process as it currently exists is one that hopes that all of the various actors on the ground and the big international actors um, on the geopolitical stage are all acting based on trust with each other, which we know full well doesn't exist. The chemical weapons attack that we saw take place in Idlib yesterday, I think, proved very clearly that the Assad regime believes that it is in the kind of preeminent position of authority. It can really do whatever it wants. In many respects, I think it has actually humiliated its main backer now in Russia on the geopolitical stage, um, who finds itself having to essentially make up stories to cover for what its proxy has done on the ground. None of that spells um, good news for the political process, and none of it spells good news for the humanitarian situation on the ground or, in fact, for the military fight. And all of it benefits extremists on all sides of the conflict, which is something that we really ought to be trying to avoid on on all sides. Such as who? Well, I mean, the the biggest one I'm concerned about because my work focuses on it is Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda has worked um, studiously for over five years on um, embedding itself within the opposition movement. For a very long time, the opposition didn't align itself with Al-Qaeda's broader views in terms of how to operate and how to behave on the ground. But, you know, every single time we see these kinds of massacres, these kinds of uh, war crimes, you know, to put it simply, take place, and then the international community community does nothing about it. It pushes al-Qaeda's broader narrative that the international community couldn't care less about what's happening on the ground, about your suffering, and therefore we are the only party here for you to ally yourselves with um, for, you know, a long-term struggle. And if, as I say, every single time these things happen, that narrative gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And I'm in daily contact with all of the armed opposition groups in Syria and with civil opposition bodies. And more and more and more often now, their language is beginning to align with that of al-Qaeda, not religiously, but politically about the fact that they are now completely isolated from the rest of the international community. Their cause is hopeless other than just to, you know, dig their heels in, continue to fight to the death. And all of that spells in the long term nothing but the growth of extremism. And as I say, that's not in anybody's interests. It's not in Assad's interests and it's certainly not in ours. And the time really has come for for some kind of coalescence of the international community to really dig our heels in now and say enough is enough. And not just to say enough is enough, but actually to act on making sure that enough is enough. And we've not seen that happen in six, six and a half years, but it's about time that we do. You've been involved in previous peace attempts. What was that like? Actually, surprisingly, I learned a great deal about how um, actors on each side of the conflict, in other words, the opposition and, and, and the pro-government side, you know what, when you put them in, in the same room together and in a neutral environment away from the conflict zone, it doesn't take them very long, in fact, less than a day to discover that their differences aren't as great as they think. And that, more than anything, has given me on the political side more, uh, you know, an inkling of hope that it is still possible to pull Syria together to put the people together in in the same room and eventually forge out some kind of negotiated settlement. But you know what what we've seen happen over the last several years is translating what I did, which was behind the scenes, preparatory kind of dialogues into the real official track one talks is very, very difficult. And it's been especially difficult because the international community hasn't been perceived on any side of the conflict to have been 100% committed to securing any kind of outcome. And until the international community is perceived by those local actors to be 100% committed to finding a a mutually agreeable outcome, then we will continue to see those official track one efforts suffer. And that's where we are now. That's where we were all the way back in 2012 when Kofi Annan was running his Annan process. Ever since that process in 2012, five years later, we're still in the same position. There isn't enough determination in the international community to really determinedly stop this conflict. If your analysis is right, and Russia has to some degree been humiliated by what happened in Idlib and the uh, explanation that's been given for it, does that offer you any uh, chink of hope? 
Well, garnering from from Russia's behaviours in the past, I, I fear that if you take that that position, which I put earlier uh, into account, Russia has put itself into a bit of a, you know, it's backed itself into a corner. It has very few options. It's never going to turn definitively against Assad because then it risks losing everything that it's fought for since 2012 and certainly since it intervened in 2015. This is this unfortunate reality which I think Moscow and the Kremlin are discovering, which is that Bashar al-Assad sitting in Damascus really does still call all of the shots. I find it very hard to imagine that the Russian government would have been linked to, involved in, or happy with this chemical attack that took place yesterday. But nevertheless, it has been forced to have to deal with the consequences. And the statement put out by the Russian Ministry of Defense, frankly speaking, is laughable. I mean, the idea that the opposition have these remarkably capable chemical weapons capabilities um, and have yet never managed to successfully use them in an offensive manner, but have repeatedly suffered the consequences of their own chemical weapons, that doesn't add up, logically speaking. And then chemically, in terms of uh, chemical weapons experts, would be the first people to tell you that the idea that you could strike a building that contained a binary nerve agent and that would set off a chemical reaction. It's a myth. It just doesn't exist in chemistry. So clearly the Russians have been backed into a corner here and they have no choice other than to support their proxy, who is increasingly becoming a troublesome partner. That's Charles Lister, who's a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. Susan.